Welcome to or welcome back to the Addicted to Transformation podcast. My name's Jay and I'm the general manager at the Canadian Health Recovery Centre and my co-host is... Cheryl, I'm the clinical director here at CHRC. We are glad to have you join us for another conversation about the transformation possible with mental health and addiction. And nothing's more important to us than helping you to take your next step towards transformation. Well, today we are really excited uh, to have in studio uh, one of our uh, addiction counselors, Michael Savage. And uh, Michael's been with us how long? About well, 14 months now. 14 months. Yeah, yeah, it's flown by, but it's been great. Mm-hmm. Michael, can you take us back to the beginning? Tell us a little bit about where you grew up, what sure. your childhood was like. Sure, I was born in Brampton, uh, moved to Stratford when I was five, um, had a really good childhood. Um, you know, three sisters growing up. Um, good home, good parents, good grandparents, the whole works. Um, played a lot of sports when I was younger. Um, but yeah, I think sports was my biggest thing. Um, we had a lot of kids on our street back in Stratford that uh, played like playing road hockey and um, baseball and so forth. So that kind of got me interested at first. And then when I was old enough, I, you know, joined sports leagues, hockey primarily, baseball. Um, so yeah, m- my life was pretty much re- revolved around sports growing up. Hmm. Yeah. You started in Brampton and then at some point Stratford was where you landed? That's right, yeah. So my sister Jill and I, who's a year younger than me, were born in Brampton and then we moved when I was five to Stratford. Um, as I say, great place to grow up, small town, um, about 32,000 people now. My family's still there, my kids are there, my grandkids are there. Um, you know, I love going back home when I can. So yeah. sports in high school still really important to you. Mm-hmm. Uh, did that kind of shape uh, your aspirations of where you were thinking of going after high school? Yeah, absolutely. Um, all through um, all through high school was crazy. I wanted nothing more than to be a play-by-play guy for a hockey team somewhere. You know, um, I had visions of being up in the gondola at Maple Leaf Gardens uh, when I was a kid. I actually used to take. I take a little tiny microphone, sit up in the corner at the um, at the hockey games at the rink, and doing the play by play into the recorder. This is probably when I was about ten or eleven, um, and I did that for a couple of years, and I knew that's what I wanted to do. Um, so I actually ended up doing that for a while uh, for the CJCS radio in Stratford. Um, I think my early twenties. There was actually an opportunity, the play by play guy that had been doing it for years, got sick right at the start of the season. And I was working part-time that summer at the radio station when the, when the play-by-play man's wife called and said that he'd been sick. He was probably going to be out of commission for a while as far as calling the games would go. And did I know anyone at the radio station that knew how to, or would be interested in this? So it was really kind of serendipitous and I ended up doing for about six years, didn't go back to school. And then from there, um, while doing the, the games up in the press box in Stratford, I met um, the um, sports editor at the newspaper and he offered me a job when a space became available then. So that so became, felt like a dream come true for it was, a young yeah. man who was so passionate about sports Absolutely. and then able to focus your entire day on it. That's right. Yeah, that's right. It was great. Now, um, Mike, lots yeah. of people would think of that role of kind of... Uh, Play by play, like you're you're having to think on your feet quickly, mm-hmm. and you're you've got an audience. Like that could be pretty intimidating for a lot of people. Was that was that kind of scary for you at all? The, the only reason it wasn't was because um, I'm talking into a microphone, and not really on the radio. You're really not in front of people. You know, there's people out there listening, but there's not really an intimate for me, anyways. There was no intimidation factor just because. Um, it was really only the people up in the press box that, that could hear me live, like the people out in the, in the rink area or in the seats weren't hearing me. Um, so no, it wasn't. And plus, growing up, like you know, my parents will tell you, I watched way too much t- um, sports on TV. So I was emulating everyone all the way up. Like I had 10 or 15 play-by-play people that I really enjoyed listening to and kind of tried to kind of model myself after them a wee bit. Um, I know, yeah, the first couple of times it was um, maybe a bit... Ner- you know, a bit nervous, maybe a, a wee bit intimidating, perhaps. Um, but after once we got going and the game got in progress, um, it was it just like natural, just took over because that was it, truly it was my life of sports for mm. very many years. Yeah. So this is you're how old now? This right now? Yeah. Uh, do I need not to right say now? That? But at this point <laughs> in your story, <laughs> at, at this point, <laughs> well, we may get around to saying how old I am. Um, 
<laughs> but we can point that out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I started in my early 20s. Um, so I was in my early 20s with one year at Acadia and came back. So yeah, I did that. So Michael, you're kind of in your early 20s, mid 20s around this point. Um, like are, are there, is life going pretty well? Like is there, is it as good as on the, below the surface as it maybe looks uh, kind of on, on the outside? Great question. No, the answer is no. Um, I was loving what I was doing, but um, at that point I was really much in the throes of addiction. Um, at least kind of starting on my career of addiction, if that's the word for it. I was out there for, for 34 years, but um, you know, it's one of those deals where, you know, in grade nine, I remember in the summer of grade nine, um, you know, someone offered a joint and so um, went ahead with that. And then it, after a while, after a few years, it seemed that any time anything was offered to me, I had an mm. inability to say no. So I tried just about everything from the age of 15 to 20, I'd say. Um, and whereas most of my friends, almost all of them, you know, maybe dabbled a wee bit, but they got on with their lives, you know, we got married and had kids and I'm still out there. And, and then it, it didn't really hit me that I had a, a problem or maybe I didn't want to admit it. But to answer your question, Jay, um, after work, after I was done a long shift, I'd go home and I'd use, and it was all I could do to get myself ready to go back in the next day. Now, now not from the start, but at some point along the way, that's what happened. And, you know, going back even further, I think I stopped playing hockey when I was about 15, it was that same year. So when I got introduced to drugs, my schooling went, you know, it was the pits and my marks were terrible all through high school. And I can absolutely trace it back to when I started using. Mm -hmm. And then my interest in sports waned as far as a particip uh, participant goes. Mm -hmm. And so I quit, quit playing hockey for a couple of years, um, ended up going back and playing a couple of the last two years of high school and then first year of university, but it was just rec league stuff. So Michael, I'm just mindful of this double life that you're leading. So yes. you're using throughout the night, trying to get, wake up in the morning again, be a sports writer. Mm -hmm. um, just wondering what that conflict was like for you, yeah. and were you even aware of it at the beginning? Yeah. Um, this dichotomy. Sure, not necessarily. Um, you know, and I was younger, so I could handle it a bit better. I think. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I had enough energy to be able to get through the day, and also I was loving what I was doing. Um, so, no, not at first. Uh, got a little bit older and wasn't able to do some of the things I, I used to do before, like physically, athletically, I guess, you know, not that I was playing many sports or anything, but, you know, tossing the ball around with the kids or, or what have you. But the biggest thing was I was hiding it from everyone, or so I thought. Mm -hmm. um, work knew, but I never knew work knew. Uh, work had a difficult time um, approaching me about it, maybe because I didn't make myself very approachable. Mm. Uh, I remember being in there and typing away, writing up a sports story, and halfway through it, I had no idea what my next sentence was or what I'd written. Mm -hmm. Probably because I was still under the influence and, you know, thinking that no one knew. But looking back on it now, or even looking back on it, you know, when I left that job, mm -hmm. um, I just loved it so much, mm -hmm. honestly. It, just, it never seemed like work, but um, the substance use did eventually catch up to me. Mm -hmm. it, it sure did, yeah. You know, by that point, I, I'd known everybody was aware, you know, and certainly they were, and they actually gave me probably the best gift I've ever had, and that was they uh, suspended me and said, you're not coming back to work until you've gone to treatment. Hmm. Um, so, Mike, as, as, uh, as kind of that addiction it begins to kind of develop some momentum and, and kind of creating that double <laughs> life of trying to maintain kind of your, your day role and, and you know, the, the mic that people kind of knew, um, but kind of what was happening behind the scenes, is there some impact to kind of the other people that are important to you in your life in this season? Absolutely. Um, the kids, I think, probably um, were negatively impacted the most. And, and I knew what was going on, and I knew that, you know, I wasn't consciously, I think, choosing drugs over the kids, but it was just the pull of, of the mm -hmm. substances that, I mean, you know, um, their mother and I split up when the kids were very young, but, she, you know, we've had a great relationship ever since, and, and I was, you know, uh, there was no problem me seeing the kids on weekends or having the kids on weekends and once through the week as long as I was clean, and so some weekends I couldn't because I just simply wasn't able, and there's no way I was going to put the kids in that situation. Um, but they're pretty smart, and they're, they know what's going on. Um, yeah, and so when I went to tr the first treatment, um, it was, it wasn't so, 
I, I guess it was mandated by work, I, I suppose. Um, but the bottom line is I wasn't ready for treatment at that time. And I didn't realize it then, but I do now looking back. Um, I went because they told me to go, so I was trying to save a job. Um, and so Mike, yeah. what, what, what impact does that have on someone who's in an environment like that, who's maybe really not as ready as they think they are or as they're talking like they are? Sure. How does that impact kind of your exposure to what's happening, like groups and counseling and all that kind of thing? Great question. I felt like I was present for all the groups. I do. Um, I don't think I was uh, necessarily ready to put the work in as much as I was um, to have a few laughs with, with the folks, um, instead of putting in, you know, the homework or whatever we needed to do or joking around, what have you. Um, and within about, I think the first time I went to treatment about 12 days later, I was back out again, mm. testing the waters. And it was crazy. Uh, the place that I used to go to, to consume my substances, I showed up there that day again, about just under two weeks after I got back from treatment, <clears throat> excuse me. And, uh, I sat there for five hours while the, the rest of the gang was, was using and I was trying to prove to myself that I could go into the lion's den and not use. So sure enough, and then what that ended up doing was sending me back out for another three months. Only this time it was much worse as they said it was going to be way worse. And I said, there's no way it's going to be worse. I'm going to know how to handle it. I'm not going to know how to use in moderation. This is no problem. I got this. No, it was way worse. You know, it's you're going, when you use again, you're going to be at the same spot that you left off at. And I was using quite heavily um, before I went, leading into me going to treatment. So it got even worse and I was back in uh, a different treatment center in March of 05. And I just got out of the previous one in November of 04, or okay. maybe even December. Yeah. And what led you in March of 05 to try again? Yeah, uh, yeah, it worked. <laughs> Mm. They knew it was now it was so bad. I have to share one story. It was so bad. So I was working a shift one night and I had used um, probably for the three days prior and I was definitely having a psychotic episode mm. and I think it's better for me if I mention this because this is what actually happened. This is how bad it was. I was typing out a story on the girls basketball game. Now I hadn't covered the game. When we don't cover the games, the coaches will email in a report and then we just do, we just kind of sink, you know, yeah. get it onto the page. But I'm reading the report and I know what I have to type in. And I start typing in, you know, Brianna scored 17 points, you know, a couple of three pointers, blah, blah, blah. And then I looked at the screen and that the letters were disappearing as faster than I was typing them. It looked like Ms. Pac-Man gobbling up the letters that were on the screen. That's how bad the supposed got. So somehow I got through that night. I don't think I got much work done that night, but I wanted to leave before my boss got there so he wouldn't see what kind of condition I was in. And sure enough, that the next day they called me and said, I don't know what happened to you last night, but um, and when my boss and his boss and the, and the managing editor and the publisher came in the next night to see me, I knew something was up. And they just assured me that this time they understood a bit more what had gone on, which I really appreciate because um, they were very like comforting. They, they, they asked me point blank, first of all, if I'd been using, I, I had no choice. I had to tell them I had. And part of me was relieved that I was caught. Um, but they just said, look, we're going to send you again. You're going to go longer this time, you know, and they said we might have made a mistake last time rushing you back to work too soon mm -hmm. because the day I got out of treat the first treatment I was back at work the next day I don't blame them at all not one bit I know I didn't put the work in but I thought that made sense that maybe after treatment I might leave stay just, busy exactly just get a bit of downtime though too and just kind of um, try and reflect on what I've just been through as far as treatment went before I you know dug back in at work so so that was great. Um, and then for years, I was fine. Absolutely fine now. I'm not saying I wasn't so that wasn't nothing. second yeah. rehab experience was, you were kind of more engaged? More engaged. More engaged. More yes. I had put the effort in that time and I felt really confident in my ability to stay clean once I left. And I know I, 36 days later, I was back out again because I wasn't doing at home what I needed to be doing. So, so the first one I was, while well, I was in treatment, I wasn't doing everything I should have been. Mm. Second time I was, but I didn't do anything. Mm. You didn't take it with you. Didn't yeah. take it with me, exactly. That's a great way to put it, Jay. I didn't take it with me. Um, however, I, I re as I recall, um, my use of a particular substance 
that was the end of that. That was the end of that, it was the second treatment. It was the thing that was keeping me out there. Um, but I found a softer substance <laughs> to replace it with. It wasn't as noticeable, I suspect, to, to work, um, but I was still relying on, on it quite a bit. A lot of consequences happened. And then work-wise, were you able yeah. to kind of stay on with the... I, I did. I was able to stay on with work in the meantime, and it was like breathing. It was like, it was just so... Because that was everything I ever did for four years was... You know, even my journals in high school, I was writing sports reports. So, I mean, it was, it was my, my life. So, I was able to kind of get away with it, so to speak. So it sounds like the transformation has started years ahead. Mm -hmm. There's little pieces that you're moving forward. There's little bits of change happening, but you're finding it really challenging to sustain that change. Correct. So then what changed in 2013 yeah. to make that lasting? Sure. Let's go back to about 2010 a wee bit, 2009, I got married. Um, and <laughs> from the moment we were married, it just, it went all downhill and it was all on me because, you know, I was thinking I was getting away with something. I really did. I th I'd go up to the garage and think, well, she doesn't know. And this went on for years. I was so non, not present, so not present. I was making choices that, you know, put her last, you know, I could see that now. And if I was looking hard at it back then, I would have seen it then too. Um, maybe I knew it instinctively, I don't know, but it was just a mess. And so she left, Becky left in early 2013, and that was a real eye-opener for me. It was like, oh my gosh, I didn't believe it was real that she was actually leaving. And it took me a while. I mean, my ego and, you know, I suppose narcissism, whatever you want, everything was way out of whack. She didn't get all of me. She didn't get everything she deserved, and she was right to leave, although I didn't see it at the time. Mm -hmm. So how did I respond? I responded by quitting my job to get mm -hmm. um, a severance pay because, oh, good, I don't have to worry about her anymore. I can just use now with all this money I'm going to get without thinking about the future or anything like that. So six months later, pretty much all my severance pay was gone. And I was back in treatment again, uh, this time, well, only after I'd taken the walk of shame back to my parents' place and said, look, mm -hmm. I've been living in my car under a bridge at the end of Avon River for the last two weeks. So I, I went to my parents' place uh, when I realized I wasn't really getting along too well. And my mother looked at me and said, you're going to treatment. You're going to go long-term this time. You're going to go down to Choices for Change in Stratford mm -hmm. like as soon as possible. You're going to tell them what's going on and they're going to find you a place. I said, okay. And again, that was kind of a relief. Yeah. And sure enough, um, I only had to, to live outside for another few days and, and they changed choices for change, found me a place. Yeah. Um, they ended up going for nine months and this time I really, really wanted it. Yeah. Um, and I think I was able to get a better grip on how my uh, use had negatively impacted everyone around me. Yeah. I mean, through it all, my parents um, and family had kind of distanced themselves from me, not because they didn't love me or anything like that. They just were, I think they were just, what are we going to do? Let's leave him alone. Let's not invite, let's not invite him over for the Sunday dinners that we have like every couple of weeks. I thought they stopped having them because they didn't call me over. I mean, that's, which is funny too. I mean, it's, because that's, it was all me, me, me. I mean, the first time I came home from, from uh, residential treatment, um, we're driving back to Stratford. They picked me up, and uh, I was waiting for the the sign saying "Welcome home, Mike." You know, ticker tape parade because I, you know, I've gone through 21 days of treatment. So they, I got to um, again a relief that someone was saying to me, "Go to treatment." When I think that's probably what I wanted to do, but wasn't able to actually say it for whatever reason. So, Michael, it sounds like uh, if we kind of reframe, you know, your first stint at uh, treatment, you weren't totally into it, and it didn't, it weren't very successful. Um, the second treatment, you were more engaged, but still not really taking it with you as you kind of went back into your kind of recovery career. Yes. Uh, and then this final stage of nine months, so a long time, kind of in uh, doing the work and fully engaged, but it sounds like you kind of walked out of that with kind of changing the way you actually lived so it, yeah. is there a sense that, that you were transforming kind of your day-to-day -day, kind of how you look at yourself and your life absolutely and and that's um that's so key you know we had a a friend of ours who, who was here not too long ago on an alumni chat that said consistency consistency mm -hmm. consistency and i know exactly what he's talking about mm -hmm. um yeah there was a, as with here there's such great balance um 
you know, at, at the treatment center I went to and that we can, you know, there's the physical, the mental, the, you know, uh, the classes, the one-on-ones, everything. The first 10 days, it's, it's interesting because when we see our guests come in here the first few days, maybe they're a little, you know, nervous, which is only natural. Mm-hmm. And I know for sure that I felt like this was the last house in the block when I was going. So if I don't get it this time, you know, I mean, I was 49 years old, yeah, 49, 49 years old. My 40s were a blur. I don't remember mm-hmm. hardly anything from my 40s, unfortunately. So there's a lost decade, which we're trying to make up for now. So what was different about that kind of entry into life after uh, after that kind of third uh, rehab experience? Yeah, it all got, um, my plane got laid out while I was in there, let's say this. Um, I learned how to manage my time better, um, and that was so key. Uh, I learned to, um, I brought, was able finally to bring some of those coping strategies that I've been taught earlier. I brought quite a few of them forward and learned new ones while I was in treatment. Um, a lot of it had to do also though, uh, staff was great, but also, and perhaps even more importantly in, in some ways, um, the men that I was in there with at the time, we were all supportive of each other, and, and that was kind of a breeding ground for success. Um, I, you, you don't have a good day every single day, and I remember, but, but not all of you have a bad day at the same time, so it, it, it was great. I mean, if I was down, I knew there'd be at least two or three guys that could pick me up again, and vice versa, and we've just had each other's back. I mean, still to this day, do. So, so Michael, yeah. um, you've walked away from the career you loved, yeah. right? So mm-hmm. so what, what do you fill up that hole with uh, now that you're kind of on this new path? Yeah. So the sponsor that I got happened to be uh, a gardener who ran his own business, mm-hmm. okay? Talk about, you know, good fortune. He just said, look, he goes, I'm in, I've watched you for the nine months. I know you've come a long way. You had a struggle when you first got here, but you got into the program and you're doing all the dues. And he says, so with that, I'd like you to come work for me if you want to. And then somewhere along the way, and I, I think it, it hit me when I was, was in my, that lengthy stay in treatment that this is something that I wanted to do for as a profession. Hmm. But I kept talking myself out of it for the next few years, saying, well, I'm in my 50s now. I'm way too old to go back to school. And then finally I said, woke up one day and said, no, you're going to go back to school because what else are you going to do? You, you love, you know, you're grateful to Ken, but you don't want to garden the rest of your life. Long story short, um, I, I applied. I looked at all the places, and Fleming College was the place to go. And sure, and you know, I just I dug in my heels. I just said, you know, I, I felt like this was my last chance, but I didn't feel like it was... Um, I was putting any pressure on myself, you know, I, I just felt really, I felt really comfortable being there back at school. I got to know and see a lot of things that kind of reminded me of myself because, you know, we working with folks that I know that I was where they are. Kind of resonate with very much season so. of life. Right? Very much so. And so that I'm grateful that I was able to kind of get out of that. Um, lifestyle and then hopefully I can I can do something to maybe make their day a bit better um, you know let them know that someone's there for them type thing mm-hmm. so I was really uh, glad I went back to school for sure and then lo and behold here we are mm-hmm. uh, yeah so Michael I know that you're such an amazing support for clients I can even just hear their tone of voice when mm-hmm. they say good morning to you in the, oh. in the morning they're so glad to see you mm-hmm. I'm wondering what what you say to clients when they say this is harder than I thought. Mm-hmm. This is more work than I thought. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's it's hard work coming to treatment and following a new schedule and attending group and digging in mm-hmm. um, to our lives. What what yeah. kind of advice do you give them at that time? Sure. Well, first of all, I, I you know I'll share with them. Yes, I know it's difficult, especially when you first get here. Uh, but and especially for those that are coming into treatment for the first time, of which quite a few obviously are coming here for the first time. But just. Kind of let them know that, that I've, I've been there. It does get better, but you, you can't take my word for it. I can't snap my fingers and make everything well. But I will say this. I know for myself, when I put the effort in, um, but when I also had balance, like time to laugh with the guys, but also time, if I needed to get something done, I had to make the choice not to watch the game that night. And that, that was very difficult for me because that's all I did was watch sports. That was my life. Um, I would tell the guys... And what we're finding here is that the the guys that have the most success are the ones that put in the work here and then take it forward and that keep in touch with us, yeah. you know, on a fairly regular basis, and actually on a regular basis. And when they leave, I, I say this, they make sure you call, make sure you call, make sure you call, and in some cases they do. Now, Michael, you, yeah. you do a lot of the follow-up calls yeah. for their clients, right? Mm-hmm. They get a, 
a call at least once a month right. kind of for for a whole year after they're in treatment so yes. what's that like talking and catching up with the guys with where they're at rewarding um extremely so and what i'm finding is that com- them picking up the phone uh, and calling is a huge step. Like I know how heavy that phone weighed when I needed it. It was 100 pounds, I couldn't lift it up. Or if I lifted it up, it was to call the dealer and not, you know, not uh, someone that I should have called for support. So I've been really impressed with that. Um, and I tell them, I say, look, your calling here is a is a is a strength move here. Don't don't be embarrassed about. Oh, I'm so ashamed I've gone back out. It's like no, you you called in. That's huge. Last time I went out, I was out for like, I don't know how many years. So you're coming. So this is great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have you noticed any transformation on yourself in the last 18 months of just being in this healing environment that we're in day in and day out? Have you noticed any changes for yourself? Yeah. Well, um, the first thing that comes to mind is I haven't had any desire to use um, those hard substances that I used to. You know, thoughts and so forth. I, I still get them. So we'll talk about that for half a second. I tell the guys, look. I'm going to get a thought every once in a while, and you're going to get a thought every once in a while. But I'm at the point now, um, because I have put the effort in, that I can just swat it away like a fly. There's no problem there. And I know what to do if it becomes more than a passing thought. I'm not saying obsessing on it. Maybe it becomes an urge. But again, I've got all the tools in the toolbox. So what I say to myself is, let's just get through the day. I know I can make it to midnight without using. Let's do that, and we'll start again tomorrow. Because it really is one day at a time. But that's not to say that we don't want to look at the future and where we want to be, you know, next month or next year or five years, what have you. But I think when we're in treatment, we need to focus on what we're doing right at the time to, to best help ourselves. For me, that also meant cutting ties with, with friends, you know, back home or, you know, even like loved ones. I mean, uh, and this is what I, I know that this is what I needed to do is get myself into treatment and I can't worry about those that d- decided not to come along type mm-hmm. thing. So I got to do what's best for me. Now, Michael, I think sometimes, you know, when we've gone through, you know, some hard years and, uh, and you know, we found something that we love to do and, and maybe addiction t- takes over in a way that, that means that, you know, it kind of crumbles or that opportunity kind of uh, is lost to us. That can be a pretty dark place in terms of thinking, where are we going to go next? Like where, how could the future be, you know, somehow meaningful mm. and purposeful and something to look forward to when... Mm you know, maybe like my best years were behind me or kind of the best opportunities I've, I've kind of screwed up. Yes. Um, do you feel like you've kind of been able to kind of uh, find that kind of the redemption in terms of uh, finding something that's as good or better than what you used to do? Absolutely. And, and I'm almost getting emotional here. Sorry, but um, I have to tell you, yeah, there are many times I've looked back and said, you, f- you fool, you know, you wasted all those years. Um, but then it's so crazy. I <laughs> I can pinpoint a Sunday morning last last winter, and I I had my headphones on. A song by the Velvet Underground came on, and one of the lines in the song I'd never heard the song or hadn't heard it in years, and it was um, it's just the wasted years. Blah blah. I don't know what they said after that, but I was in such a good mood. It hit me that wait a minute. They weren't wasted years. Mm-hmm. And so I listened to it and I said, no, no, they weren't wasted years. And I'm arguing with mm-hmm. the Velvet Underground, like we were reading Olu, they mm-hmm. weren't wasted years. Mm-hmm. And somehow I've never been able to get past that and be comfortable with where I am now. Now, not every day is great, as, as you know, <laughs> as, as you've seen me in here, it, not every day is great. But um, life is so much better now. And I, and I somehow it's like, I'm, I'm more grateful that I'm still alive and able to, to talk about think about this or to enjoy my life and you know when I can get home and enjoy my kids and my grandkids um, and they don't feel like wasted years all of a sudden it, it seemed to me that somewhere in here that I would want to be involved in, in helping others mm-hmm. and, and so I really enjoy being mm-hmm. here and I've known for quite a while even if you know it took me a long time to get here that this is ultimately something that i wanted to do mm. um yeah and that a lot of that has to do with with the people that i was mentored by over the years especially that treatment center that went for nine months i met a lot of people that were um years in recovery and they said the same thing they said we can't snap our fingers and give it to you right now you have to earn it but what we will say to you is that um life gets better and it keeps getting better. And I didn't want it. I was, no way. I mean, 
how can anyone watch the Super Bowl without, you know, the, the two, four beer in front of them or what have you? Or how can, or if it's Wednesday, you know, how can you get through a Wednesday? But sure enough, they were right. They were right. And I laughed. I was laughing at them at first. And, you know, you're talking about, they're so right. And I tell that to the guys here too. And I said, just trust the process, put in the work. Mm-hmm. I said, we've had so many success stories in the time that I've been here that I can tell you exactly what, what you need to do, you know, and then you're going to, you're going to mold your recovery your way, but here's some, some ideas, here's some things to think about. Um, and then you just shape it however you want. So like one of the things that I think your story just kind of drives home and, and sure we've talked about this recently is the, uh, is, is that sometimes we have a, a really narrow view of recovery being something that should just take weeks or months. Mm. Um, like from your first kind of, kind of push into treatment to your final nine months of treatment. What's the span of years? What's the span of time that's in there? About 10 years, yeah. just under 10 years. And, yeah. and the, some of the stats that we're seeing mm-hmm. uh, would just kind of uh, reinforce that idea that, that uh, most people are spending something like eight years in their recovery career, right? Mm-hmm. So that's their first attempts to take a step and reach out for some help or identify that they have a problem. And, uh, and, and whatever that might be, whether it's just counseling or groups or <laughs> actually doing residential treatment, yeah. that, uh, that it's not unusual for that to take, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, for years and, you know, a number of years. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's important. Why do you think that's an important yeah, you know, thought for people to appreciate? Just understanding that the level of persistence, right, in your mm-hmm. story, that mm-hmm. you kept getting up, you kept trying something. So you might have said, well, I tried that, it didn't work. And instead, you rewrote that for yourself that said, mm-hmm. oh, how could I work that better? Mm-hmm. Or how could I work that in a different way? Right. right? Yeah. And just trying to stay that, in that consistent uh, recovery path. And yes. it's like we can take two steps back, but we still have the opportunity to move three steps forward. That's right. I love that idea of, and I think it's something that's uh, been a big part of, of my vision for what I do here is that we're trying to help guys become experts in their own recovery. Yeah. Right? That everyone's journey is going to be unique. It depends on where they've been and what they've done and what they've what they bring to it. Um, and and that's really the goal is trying to figure out how do you how does every guy become an expert in their own recovery, right? Yeah, absolutely. The recovery became recovery became my life, mm-hmm. you know? Um, mm-hmm. So you put that ahead of everything else is mm-hmm. what they tell you to do. And sure enough, I, as I reflect on it, without even kind of realizing it, but reflecting on the totality of it all, yeah, yeah, it has become my life. Well, yeah. and identity is such a big part mm-hmm. of, I think, who we are in every season of life. Mm-hmm. Um, but we think of, of an extended season, right, where we potentially are identifying ourselves by our addiction, yes. right? That becomes how we see ourselves, how we limit ourselves, yeah. how we think people see us, yeah. um, what we're not allowed to do or not, uh, you know, feel free to try, all that kind of stuff. Sure. And recovery really does require this, um, you know, this change, transformation of how I see myself. Now, my career as someone stuck in addiction, my new career is recovery. Yeah, right. And, and I think that that's that's just a really important thing for people to yeah. to try and remember when they're kind of stuck in some of these repetitive cycles where it feels like you're just you're not going anywhere. Yeah, right? that's great. I mean, thanks for that, Jay. I hadn't really thought of that way the way you put it, but you're right. The, the career of using it versus the career of recovery, and that's fine. You know, I'm really enjoying life, and I'm not so worried anymore about having missed missed those years mm-hmm. yet. So my, well, I know you're a real beacon of hope here at the center with so many clients. And I'm just wondering, thinking about some people that might be listening to us um, right now, and they're maybe losing some of that hope. So sure. hopelessness has crept in because of their substance use and yeah. some of the chaos that comes with addiction. Right. I'm wondering what you would say to them. Yeah, well, thanks for that question, Cheryl. Um, I definitely felt hopeless uh, at times. Uh, I would say, give it a try, give yourself um, the opportunity to let you know what the outcomes have been or, you know, what your life is like when you're using. And if it's anything like me, it was, it was a nasty hell. Um, it was never worth the price of that first hit, if you like, and I'm sure anyone listening out there knows what I'm talking about, the repercussions or, and, and so forth just aren't worth it. And I, I would invite them to think of that. Now that alone isn't going to be enough and for most cases. They're going to have to have a desire to, to get better and, and get help. Um, for me, I think I had that desire, but 
didn't necessarily let it come to the surface. Mm-hmm. Maybe because I wanted to hang out with the people I was hanging out with and was more worried and concerned about what they may say. And so that was on me for not listening to, to myself. So I would say, listen, listen to yourself. Um, you know, it's that hard. It, talk it over with uh, people you rely on and that you trust. Um, for me, I needed an extra nudge to get to get back to treatment. I think part of the deal for me was I got, and you've heard this before, but I did get sick and tired of being sick and tired. Mm. So it's not easy. I'll, I'll, I'll give you that. It's not easy. Mm. But I guess my suggestion would be give it a try. You know what that life is like mm. out there. Why don't you give yourself an opportunity to see if you prefer recovery, you know, focus on yourself. And if it doesn't take, well, it doesn't take, at least you've given yourself a shot. Mm. But don't cheat yourself. I cheated myself like the first two times I went to treatment, as we've discussed, by not putting in the effort. So I would say if you're going to do it, go. Get help, whatever that looks like, and stick to it, you know, as best you can. Um, Try and get into a rhythm every day. Um, Then pick a time where we might normally use or when you feel like using and do something else and just see how those next 10 minutes go, right? And I had to tell these guys that too, you know, let's just get through the next minute you know we might have to white knuckle it yeah. first and we might have to fake it till we make it and i've done all of those things and 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 here i am now it's taken a long time um but it's so worth it in the end just just, just give it a try you know it can't it can't hurt to give it a try because you know what what's out there nice. yeah like we just really appreciate mm-hmm. oh having you uh i mean here with us oh. but uh, we also get to hang out with you almost every day mm-hmm. uh, and it's a real privilege to have someone with uh lived experience uh, as well as some of the academic training mm-hmm. that uh that just makes you the kind of person that can relate to our clients on just such a significant level um obviously not everyone connects with everyone on the same level but that's why we've got this amazing team of, uh, of staff who have different personalities and different strengths and different experiences that really gives all of our clients multiple people, multiple voices, multiple kind of soft spots to land and help unpack stuff and help uh, kind of give different perspectives on things. And, and uh, I know when the guys get a chance to get a little bit of your story uh, in a group, it uh, we can just feel the difference in this place after they've done that. So we just want to thank you for uh, being addicted to transformation. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. Thank you so much, James. Cheryl. Awesome. Thanks for joining us on today's episode of Addicted to Transformation. If you or someone you know is struggling with addiction and mental health, please call 1-844-264-9909. That's 1-844-264-9909 or www.canadianhealthrecoverycenter.ca.